In our gospel passage today, we meet some fishermen who have fished all night but have caught nothing. They come in and Jesus teaches the crowds from these fishermen's boats. And when he finishes teaching, Jesus tells the fishermen to go back out into the deep water. And I want to pause here for a minute because whenever the ancient Jews talked about deep water. It was code word for chaos. The water, the ocean, the lake, any body of water was symbolic of chaos in the ancient Jewish world. You never knew if the water was going to be calm one minute and chaotic the next. We see this in the first chapter of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. The waters hover over the earth, and they were chaotic, and the Spirit of God hovers over the water to bring a sense of order to the chaos of the waters. Our ancient ancestors associated water with chaos. The waters of the earth can be very dangerous, we know. The Jews made this association, but so did other ancient peoples. The Babylonians, for example, thought that a god named Tiamat was the god of the sea. Tiamat was also the god of chaos. You never knew if the god Tiamat, and thus the sea, was going to be calm and peaceful or chaotic and deadly. And here is Jesus sending the people back out into the sea, out into chaos. Those who first heard this story would have heard the symbolism within it. There is chaos in the world, and that's exactly where Jesus is sending us. Can you relate at all? Do you ever feel like the world is in total chaos? That's how Jesus and his first disciples felt. They were safe on the land and the shore, and yet Jesus says to them, go back into the waters of chaos. This isn't safe discipleship. Sometimes you go into the chaos. But the sea wasn't just a symbol of chaos that day. That night, it was also empty. The fishermen were out in the sea all night, and they didn't catch a thing. There were no fish. It was chaotic. It was dangerous. And even worse, it was pointless for them to go back out into the sea They were exhausted after a long night of pointless fishing, and now Jesus told them to go back. One of the fishermen, a man named Simon, told Jesus that they had fished all night and caught nothing. Simon just finished cleaning his nets, which was quite an ordeal in and of itself. Simon felt that it was pointless and hopeless to go back into the chaotic waters But he also trusted this man, Jesus, and so he went back into the sea. Sometimes the world seems so chaotic that we might begin to feel that there is no point. Nothing we can do will help. We feel defeated and cynical. Simon could have said to Jesus, are you kidding me? We've been fishing all night. There's no fish out there, and it's pointless. And sometimes we might feel jaded and cynical, like things are hopeless. I feel especially this way when it comes to the chaos of our current political environment. Our political situation is dominated by lies and scapegoating. From the top down, it's chaotic, and in a certain sense, it's meant to be chaotic. So that we constantly move from one scandal to the next. Guess what? Jesus comes to us exactly in these situations and says, get up, get back in your boat, go into the chaos, and go catch some fish. Because because the world doesn't need any more cynicism. The world doesn't need any more lies and scapegoating. The world needs hope. The world needs the truth of the gospel message that says that God loves you and God loves me And God calls us to love one another as we love ourselves and we work for a more just world for all people. But I'm the first to admit that this isn't easy. 
I would often much rather stay on the shore. But that's exactly why this message is important. We live in a culture that runs on lies and scapegoating as opposed to a culture that emphasizes love of neighbor. In our Hebrew scripture lesson this morning, Isaiah meets God, who sends Isaiah on a mission. Isaiah says that he is unworthy of this mission because he is a man of unclean lips and he lives among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah had dirty lips and his people had dirty lips. What does that even mean, though? I think it means in part that Isaiah and his people were living a lie. They were living a lie of scapegoating. The truth was found in Isaiah's scriptures that said that all people are created in the very image of God. The truth that the message of the gospel has to give is that all people have an equal sense of this holiness and this sacredness within us. But the lie is that Isaiah's culture believed is the same lie that so many in our culture believes. And that lie gives us unclean lips. It's the lie that divides the world into us and them. Some people are worthy and they are not worthy. The political, economic, and religious leaders of Isaiah's and of Jesus' day believed that the rich and the powerful were more worthy than the poor and the destitute. This lie was so pervasive that tragically, the poor and the destitute began to believe the lie too. They internalized it. And here's the thing about the lie that some people are more worthy than others. It is based on scapegoating. But scapegoating brings a false sense of order into our chaos. It creates a status quo, which is a way that we order ourselves by knowing who is worthy and who isn't worthy. When a people believe in this lie so fervently, it be, they become consumed by a spirit of hostility, and they de eventually destroy themselves. Did you catch this at the end of the Isaiah reading that seemed very ominous? That's the warning that Isaiah gives. Isaiah asks, how long? How long are we going to live this way? And God responds, you're probably going to live this way until the city lies in waste without inhabitants and the houses without people and the land is utterly desolate because this is what the pattern will eventually bring us to. The people refused to hear the truth. Instead, they believed the lie and that led them into chaos and disaster. Every Sunday, I try to offer an example of how the biblical text relates to our lives in the modern world. Jesus sent his followers back into the sea, into the chaos, and because they trusted Jesus, they found an abundance of fish. And Isaiah's warning remains true to us today. If no one goes out into the chaos and the lies, then the cities will lie in waste and the land will become utterly desolate. Jesus sends us back in, out into the chaos, and we know that there is plenty of chaos out there. I mean, take your pick on what chaotic scandal of the day you want to focus on. There are times when I go out into the chaos and it seems to infect me. It's like it absorbs me. I absorb it into myself. And like Isaiah, I have to admit that I am a man of unclean lips, in part because I live in a culture that has unclean lips, which brings up a question. How do we go into the chaos without being infected by the chaos. Let me give you an example. Racism in America has been part of the tragedy and chaos of our history. We recently discovered that the governor of Virginia appeared in blackface in his medical school yearbook. Governor Northam stumbled over an apology and has refused to de resign despite many calls for him to do so. I think the best response to this situation comes from an African-American pastor and theologian named William Barber II. William Barber is probably the most important theologian alive today, in my opinion. In an article for the Washington Post, Barber talks about Governor Northam's offensive blackface picture, and he writes, to African-Americans who have survived the status quo of American racism, this is hardly a surprise. And I think we can all agree that no one should wear blackface, especially today.
But Barber then makes the same point, the, the most important point that I've seen about this issue, and that's this. He says, scapegoating politicians who are caught in the act of interpersonal racism will not address the fundamental issue of systemic racism throughout our nation. There are consequences to Governor Northam's personal actions, but as Barber claims, if anyone wants to call for the governor's resignation, they should also call for the resignation of anyone who has supported racist voter suppression or policies that have disparate impact on communities of color. Of course, I don't know if Governor Northam continues to hold racist views. But I do know that when it comes to racism, I am like Isaiah. I am also a man of unclean lips. I live in Oregon, a state I love, but it's a state with a long history of unclean lips. And I live in the United States, a country that I also love, but a country that also continues to have unclean lips when it comes to racism. Getting rid of Northam won't suddenly clean my lips or anyone else's lips when it comes to racism. No matter what happens with Northam, his story is a tragic reminder that we, especially those of us who are white, have more work to do to end structural racism in our country. Jesus tells us to get back in our boats and go out into the chaos, to work, to vote, and pray for a transformed society where political, economic, and educational policies are no longer heavily influenced by racist structures of white supremacy. And one of the many things that I love about this church community is that we're all in the same boat. I love our boat. Even when all seems hopeless, Jesus tells us to get back into this boat and here we are together. We are members of this body of Christ, and the body of Christ is gay, it is lesbian, and it is straight. It is black, and it is brown, and it is white. It is Democrat, and it is Republican. And personally, I need you in this boat that we call Clackamas United Church of Christ. The fact that this church, in all of our diversity, continues to meet week after week, you give me hope. You help me fight back the cynicism that the world is just a chaotic mess. Because indeed, the world is a chaotic mess. <laughs> but there is also truth and beauty and goodness in the world. And I see that here at this church. And I am grateful for all of you for helping me to see that and to live it out. So may we continue to give each other hope as we continue to work for a world that is more just and loving for all people. Amen. Hi everyone, this is Adam Erickson, reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Clackamas United Church of Christ. We are located at 15303 Southeast Webster Road in Milwaukee, Oregon. We are so glad that you found this podcast. All of our podcasts will always be free but we rely on the financial support of our members and our friends. If this podcast meant something to you, you can help us out in two ways. You can share this podcast with someone you think might be interested. You can also help us financially by donating to the wonderful missions we have here at Clackamas United Church of Christ. To do so, you can go to our Facebook page, our website, or our YouTube channel and click on the Donate Here button. Our worship services start at 10.30 on Sundays, except for during the summer months when we start at 10 o'clock. If you would like more information on our church, you can visit our website at c-ucc.org. You can also reach out to me through email at adam at c-ucc.org. Until next time, grace and peace be with you.